Welcome to Brainstorm, where we give you a glimpse into the world of science for this Wednesday, October 10th, 2012. We begin with a story from the world of technology, specifically a new kind of technology being called transient electronics. This is being mainly developed by engineers at Tufts University and are exactly what they sound like, electronics that are temporary. While these have tremendous environmental implications, the current focus is developing devices for biomedical applications. Surprisingly, these devices are quite similar to conventional electronics, being made from silicone and magnesium components. A challenge was getting these materials to dissolve in water or bodily fluids, but this was solved by constructing circuitry from nanometer-thick membranes. At this scale, even silicone will dissolve within minutes, but that's obviously not useful for many applications. Which brings us to the second major component of transient electronics, silk protein coatings. We've discussed silk before as a useful material, but in this case, the proteins are recrystallized, allowing for variable stability. Meaning the silk coatings, and by extension the entire device, could have a customizable lifespan for minutes to years. And this has gone beyond theoretical work. The group has successfully tested and implanted transient electronics in mice. One was a thermal device that was designed to monitor and prevent infections after a surgery. Another device that was designed was a nanothin 64-pixel digital camera. It's only a matter of time before transient electronics are used in humans, and the implantable devices will likely get more complex, able to react to their surroundings. The medical applications are exciting, but this work also opens the door for highly biodegradable consumer electronics. Our next story is from the world of genetics. We've discussed genetically engineered plants before, but not as often as their exciting news about genetically engineered animals. However, scientists in New Zealand have successfully bred a cow that produces hypoallergenic milk. Around 2 to 3 percent of infants are allergic to cow milk, but what you may not know is that a large portion of those reactions are due to a specific protein, particularly beta-lactoglobulin, BLG for short, which is a milk whey protein not found in human breast milk. Interestingly, though, previous work had not shown a particular function for the protein. So, the scientists wanted to try eliminating or greatly reducing BLG quantities from milk. They first used a mouse model. First, mice were engineered to produce the sheep version of BLG, then engineered to express microRNAs. These tiny strands of RNA are specifically designed to block the production of a protein, by binding to the messenger RNA that act as the protein's instructions. This technique is known as RNA interference and was successful in reducing BLG by 96% in the mice milk. Next, they engineered Daisy, a female calf that expressed the same microRNAs that worked in the modified mice. To save on time, they hormonally induced lactation and collected a small amount of milk for analysis. It showed no detectable levels of BLG and a surprising increase in the production of a different milk protein particularly casein, which doubled in quantity, this counteracted the overall reduction in protein. The next step is raising and breeding days to see if the milk composition changes with natural lactation. If further work is successful, it could lead to hypoallergenic milk being commonly available. It's also a general success story of animal engineering, potentially encouraging more use of RNA interference. And from the world of medicine, as you probably know, leukemia is cancer of blood cells and often difficult to treat. One treatment that can work is a bone marrow stem cell transplant. Unfortunately, around half of patients who receive a transplant developed graft-versus-host disease, a very serious and often fatal complication. This presents a challenge. On one hand, the donor cells are meant to kill the leukemia, so weakening them isn't really an option. But they can also be harmful of attacking healthy tissue, often the skin, liver, and gastrointestinal tract. To solve this issue, researchers at Washington University have been experimenting with the mouse model, looking for ways to guide the donor T-cells away from healthy tissue. They had luck by knocking out a particular protein with a known role in inflammation called interferon gamma receptor. These engineered cells seemed to avoid the GI tract and other organs, although the skin was still somewhat affected. However, this didn't deter the researchers. Graft-versus-host disease of the skin is the least harmful, whereas intestinal damage is frequently fatal. While there are many potential drug targets associated with interferon gamma, the next tried two inhibitors of JAK kinases, downstream molecules activated by interferon gamma. In the mice, these drugs seem to have the same protective effects as knocking out the original receptor, and one of these JAK inhibitors is already FDA approved. After these successful proof-of-principle experiments, the next step is working toward human testing. 
Hopefully, this research will lead to an effective way to counter graft-versus-host disease, saving lives. Our final story is an update from the world of material science. We've discussed solar power many times on Brainstorm before, often advances in solar panel technology. With the sun's energy being variable and intermittent, much research is going into effective ways to store that power. Scientists in Germany have developed a material that may advance artificial photosynthesis research. Unlike biological photosynthesis, in which the sun's energy is used to make sugar, artificial photosynthesis is purely the chemical splitting of water into hydrogen and oxygen. Hydrogen gas is a fairly ideal fuel source, as it can be compressed or chemically converted for storage. However, there are some challenges. An artificial photosynthesis generator is generally a semiconductor dipped in water and exposed to light. Unfortunately, many common photovoltaic materials like silicon begin corroding when active in water. So these scientists made a hybrid material by coating the silicon in a layer of carbon nitride. Now carbon nitride is generally only in powder form, but other work this group has done allowed them to form thin polymer layers of the substance. This hybrid material was stable and capable of generating substantial quantities of hydrogen when exposed to visible light. Although the process is currently dependent on acidic conditions and further enhanced by an external electrical field, in the hopes of improving the material, the scientists did a detailed analysis of the material's surface, specifically how the polymer interacted with the silicon. From this, they found the polymer layer could be thinner by incorporating metal atoms increasing the conductivity. Next is further optimization of this material, with the goal of efficient hydrogen production in normal water. If that is successful, it should lead to effective storage and increased use of solar energy. Well, hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, please consider subscribing and be sure to check the links in the video description.